Salome, this is Onia. In this video, I'm going to be discussing my controversial view on the Ten Commandments. The, my understanding of the Ten Commandments is similar to my understanding of certain passages in the Bible where it appears, it appears to say everyone has done something. So uh, I'll explain a little bit. For, so for example, in, in Romans, Paul says, For all have sinned. All have sinned. The implication is that everyone has sinned. That's what people think when they read it. However, the way the word all is used in the scriptures is very different than how a lot of people think. I'll, I'll give a example where Scripture says all people, everyone from the region came to be baptized. But in that same chapter, it then says, it says other people who were from that region had not come to be baptized. So how could it be that everyone had come, but some people didn't? Um, I'll give you a modern example outside of the Bible to help you understand, oh, okay, I see how all could not mean everyone. So if you say if you if you say something like you went to a party and everyone was drunk. You went to your friend's house and everyone was drunk. That's not saying that every single person in the entire world who has ever lived and every being was drunk. It's a very specific context. It's the all is connected to the context of everyone in, at the party. In the same way, we see that in Scripture, where when when writers of Scripture say that all have sinned, it's not saying every single person who's ever lived has sinned. It's referring to a specific group. And also, we see all is used in two distinct ways in scripture. One, it's used, and not just scripture, but in language in general. One is all is used to mean some of all types. Some of all types. So not every single instance of every single type, but every type, but only some of every type. So, you know, all people, all people get diseases. It's not saying every single person gets a disease. What it's saying is young people, babies, old people, teenagers, middle-aged people, women, man, black, white, Asian, anything. They get diseases. All get diseases. Everyone gets diseases. But it's not saying that every single person is getting diseases. Uh, we people might object that that seems awkward to use all like that but we sometimes do that in English and we that definitely occurs in the scriptures there are many instances where that way of using it is used and then another example of how we use all that's the one we're more used to it's all of a type all of some type so you can use all to refer to everyone of a particular group or all groups, but only some of all those groups. So those are the two ways we see it used in Scripture. I say all that to help you understand how, okay, when it says all, it doesn't necessarily mean every instance, but it's all of a certain type. So, um, so when it comes to the Ten Commandments, when you see commandments, it's not necessarily saying every single instance of this behavior is forbidden. So I'll give some, uh, I'm going to go through the Ten Commandments now. And I will share my view that every single one of the Ten Commandments is only forbidden in one sense and not in every sense. 
there are different senses to these commandments or to these ideas. And only the specific idea is being condemned and forbidden across the board. But in, in the other nuances, in the other way of approaching the same topic from a different angle, it's suddenly not forbidden, in my view. It's suddenly not wrong. It's not immoral. Even though it's technically, if you want to be super literal, it would be a violation of the Ten Commandments. But in its intention, the way the, 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 the law was intended was for a very specific context and not a different context. So I'm going to go through that right now. So we've got, the first, one, one of the commandments is, you shall have no other gods beside, besides the one true God. So, now we understand what that means. It's saying don't worship other gods uh, in the way of, don't place them on the, on the level of honor similar to God. God is higher than every other being. So they should not be on the same bar. We should not be comparing them as if they're peers. At the same time, while it says you shall have no other gods, we see many other passages in Scripture which speak of gods being a good thing and not a bad thing. Like when the Messiah in the Gospel of John says, The law says you are gods. So why do you take issue with me saying I am the son of God? When the law says humans are gods, that's, that's the Messiah's argument in the Gospel of John chapter 8. He explicitly calls us gods. We also see in the book of Exodus that Moses is a god to Pharaoh. We see in the law of Moses in Exodus in the Septuagint version, which is correctly translated, it speaks of us having a command to not disrespect our gods. In context, it's referring to our overseers, our superiors, our leaders. It's not saying gods in the sense of worshiping them as deities, but it's gods in a different sense. So we also see um, we see that we see that God is king of kings. What does that mean? Well, it means there are kings, there are actual kings, and he's king of all of them. All of them, you know, kings, it's not bad for people to be kings. People can be kings, but he's the ultimate king over all the other kings. Same thing with lords. It's not bad to be a master over another. Some masters are valid masters, but he's the ultimate master. He's the master of masters, the lord of lords. And the same goes with how scripture says he's the God of gods. So that means there are some other gods which are valid gods. But he's the God of gods. He's above all of them. And we are not to place the other gods on a similar level as the one true God, the ultimate God. So in one sense, we're not supposed to have any gods beside him. But in another sense, we are, because we are gods. The human leaders are gods, according to the scripture. So, God of gods, well, the gods are beside him, but they're beneath him. And so, we see also that um, the Messiah, the uh, Thomas in the Gospel of John, refers to the Messiah as my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God, he calls him. Well, the Father says that the Messiah will sit on his right hand. And what does that mean, the right hand? The right hand is beside God. So if Thomas is calling the Messiah his God, and the Messiah is at the right hand of the Father, that means Thomas's God is beside the Father. So apparently Thomas has a God beside beside God, beside the Father. According to the New Testament, however, 
that's a good thing and not a bad thing. It's not forbidden. So you see the nuances there, the interesting difference. Same thing with idols. We want, we want to be careful with the idol thing because we see in Scripture examples of idols which are valid and idols which are not valid. The uh, God commanded Moses to make an idol, to make a bronze serpent. And that everyone who looked at the bronze serpent would be healed of their sickness. Why would God do that? That's like almost encouraging them to be doing idolatry. To give an idol power to heal them just by looking at them? That seems like it's confusing sending mixed signals here. Well, the fact is, it's not wrong to have an idol in a certain way. It's wrong to have an idol in, an, in a specific way, but not in other specific ways. The basic thing is not to worship the idol, an idol as a deity or as a god. But you can make yourself an idol or a... It says, do not make yourself a likeness of anything. Well, hold on a second. In the Bible, we see many examples of God commanding us to make likenesses of, of things. It says in Exodus, do not make a likeness of anything on earth, any creature on earth or in the heavens or in the waters, anything. And yet we see it's commanded. The law of Moses commands to make cherubim, which is our angels, carved angels, onto the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we see Solomon makes likenesses of animals in the temple, in his temple that he made in, in 1 Kings. Uh, we, that account is in 1 Kings. And we also see... We see... Uh, in Ezekiel, we see commands from God himself to make carvings of pictures of animals and plants and such on the walls of the temple. So we have God specifically commanding these people to make likenesses and idols. What happened later to the, to the, the bronze serpent? It actually became a literal idol where they started worshipping it. And started sinning. So you could see here how on the one hand it was commanded by God and they weren't abusing it but later on they started abusing it and then it became forbidden. Pictures. We use pictures in modern times. If you take a picture of something with cameras, the very little definition of taking pictures with a camera is making a likeness of something, making it an idol. And so we, you know, videos, same thing, when you make a video, uh, when you watch TV or movies, you're watching a likeness. You're making yourself a likeness when you're doing that stuff. Uh, when you're using the computer, you're using the computer right now. Well, this computer creates a likeness of everything under the sun. It creates idols, but it's not wrong to use a computer. It's not wrong to take pictures. So you see how it doesn't have to be always wrong to have an idol, so long as you're not worshiping that idol as a god or a deity, or giving power to an, an idol that it doesn't have. That would be wrong. Now also it speaks of not bowing down to idols or likenesses. Again, it's a very specific context. Don't worship them as deities. It's not saying you can't bow down to them necessarily. Because, for example, if you've got a, um, you know, if you're, if you, if there's a picture on the floor and you're bowing down to get a better view of it, if you're trying to get a better view of it, that's not the point of what it's trying to forbid. Same thing with serving them. You know, uh, you may have to fix some of these things. You might have to fix your computer. That could be interpreted as serving the idol, but obviously it's not serving it in the, in the sense that God was intending to forbid. The sense he was intending to forbid is serving them as deities, gods. 
Now let's we go to the uh, you should not take God's name in vain. Yehua, Yehua. We have that yes, but then we've got in Solomon where he says, "All is vanity. Everything is vanity." You could also render, "Do not take God's name in vain." You could render it as, "Do not take His name for a vain purpose." It actually says in the Hebrew, it has a prefix, Lamed prefix, which means to or for, or according to or after. So do not take God's name for vanity, to vanity, according to vanity, after vanity. It's all these meanings. So it could be rendered as do not take God's name for a vain purpose for a vain purpose. Do not use God's name in a vain way, for a vain reason. And when if you re render it like that, well, you, you could argue, for example, that certain activities are vain in and of themselves. Uh, so we shouldn't be using his name in those during those activities that we do. Them. You could argue um, when you're going when you're going to the bathroom. And then you, you're having trouble going to the bathroom because you're constipated or something, and you start praying and using his name. Someone could try to argue you should not be using his name for a vain purpose because they could argue that going to the bathroom is, is a vain activity. It's an empty activity. It's a, it's a wasteful activity. So you shouldn't be using his name during a, such an uh, unclean time as going to the bathroom. But I, I think that's not the intention. So we can use God's name for vain things because apparently, according to Solomon, all is vanity. If all is vanity, then that means we're inevitably going to be using his name in a vain way because no matter what we do, all is vanity. So you see right there how, how if you look at it from a different perspective, all of a sudden it's not always wrong, the specific words of the commandments that are being given to us. So what does it mean you should not take God's name in vain? It means don't use it in a disrespectful way. Don't use it in an unholy way. It's not saying it can never be used uh, for a vain thing because all is vanity. So there you go. Now you've got you shall not do work on the Sabbath day. You got that commandment, but on the other hand, it's only it's only talking about certain types of work because other work is allowed. The Messiah clearly tells us that it is good to help others and heal others is a work that is allowed on the Sabbath. And even Jubilee speaks of how the work of the priest, the Messiah confirms that the work of the priest is allowed on the Sabbath day. So work is allowed on Sabbath. So when it says you don't do any work on the Sabbath, it's understood that it's talking about a very specific type of work. Secular work. It's not talking about it's not talking about every possible meaning of work. Because then that would be absurd and it would be silly. We also know that the Sabbath command was not given to every being in the world. It was not given to animals, it was not given to plants, it was not given to stars. It was it was given to angels, as according to Jubilees we're told. And according to Jubilees we're told that it was not even given to all the Gentiles. It's only given to God's people who are in covenant with him. And that was before the Messiah came, it was only Israel. So only Israel was commanded to keep the Sabbath, according to the book of Jubilees. And I believe that 100% is true. And so the Gentiles before the Messiah came had no obligation to keep the Sabbath because it was never for them. It was never intended for them. It was only intended for God's holy people that were in covenant with him. And this was extended in the New Testament, according to the New Testament of the Ethiopian Bible. It was extended to all those who are who join the New Covenant in the church. They don't have to be Israel anymore to keep the Sabbath. They just have to become uh, baptized in the, into the true church. And now they're bound to keep the Sabbath 
But everyone who's not an Israelite, still, to this, in this very day, the Sabbath command is not for everybody. It's not for all Gentiles. It's not for unbelievers. It's for believers. And it's for believers, who, only believers who are in an actual covenant with God. And it's only two. The Old Covenant, which is the Israelites, they have to be in that covenant to keep the Sabbath. And then the New Covenant, um, they have to be part of the true church and baptized into it in order to keep the Sabbath day. One of those. If you're not part of the church and if you're not an Israelite, the Sabbath is not for you. So we see the command not to work on the Sabbath doesn't exclusively apply or universally apply to everyone into all type of work. Only a specific type of work is it forbidding. Now we also got you should honor your father and your mother. On the one hand, we're supposed to always honor them, but on the other hand, we're not supposed to always honor them. What does that mean? We're not supposed to always honor what they want because sometimes they want evil things and they might command you or order you to do something evil, contrary to God and contrary to moral righteousness. Imagine if your parents tell you to help to gang rape someone or to to help them murder someone you can't do that you have to, to disobey your parents in that situation and for them they would be dishonored that you disobeyed them so you have to look at it from a certain perspective what so when it says honor your father and mother what does it mean it means respect them as they deserve to be respected it's a similar thing for love and hate in scripture we're told we're told uh love others and not just to love your friends and your family but also to love your enemies we're told yeah in other places in the scripture we're told to hate our enemy and david in the book of psalms says he hates the wicked with a perfect hatred and god says he hates those who do evil he hates the wicked so on the one hand god loves everybody but he also hates the the wicked and david has a perfect hatred for the wicked and yet, we're also supposed to love our enemies. So how does that all work? The answer is, it's a certain type of love that we're supposed to give everybody. And a certain type of love we're not supposed to give everybody. Same thing for hate. For a certain type of hate, we're not supposed to hate anyone. But another type of hate, we are supposed to hate lots of people. We're supposed to hate those who deserve to be hated in the certain way that they deserve to be hated. Uh, so we see that. And then we also see, you shall not kill. Many people will cite this commandment as say, the well, Bible says you shall not murder, but the actual Hebrew says you shall not kill. Or there's a better translation, if you like, you shall not slaughter. But there's places in the Bible where it uses that same Hebrew word in a righteous way, to kill someone righteously. And there's many places in the Bible where God commands his people to kill others, including certain places where God commands the righteous to kill women. And children, innocent infants, and animals. So God is commanding to kill people who are innocent. All throughout Scripture, we see also God commands Abraham to kill his own son, who's innocent, as a human sacrifice. He doesn't follow through with it, but the very fact that God even commanded it of him indicates that God's standard is not that killing is always wrong, but that a certain type of killing is wrong. So, the certain type of killing is always forbidden, but when it's not that certain type of killing, then it's acceptable. So, it's acceptable to kill in self defense, acceptable to kill in a just war, acceptable to kill, execute someone who deserves to be executed justly, according to the Bible standard of, of capital punishment. So, we see that the command to not kill has many exceptions based on different senses of kill then we got do not, do not bear false witness well on the one hand we're told you know don't bear false witness but then what about if you accidentally bear false witness if you remember something but you get the mistakes wrong accidentally because you have a bad memory it's not your fault that you bore false witness so what is this command talking about? Is this command saying you're an evil person if you had a bad memory and you gave a bad testimony with some slight errors and slight falsehoods in your testimony? No, it's not talking about 
slight errors and mis mistakes and misunderstandings. It's talking about an intentional falsehood where you know that the person did not do something or that they did do something and you falsely testify contrary to the truth in order to either get revenge on the person or to benefit the person in a way that they don't deserve to be benefited, to protect them from the law. That's what it's telling us to, to uh, do not bear false witness for that purpose. And um, many people understand do not bear false witness means do not lie. When it says do not lie, it's not saying that we can't deceive people ever either. Deception is sometimes valid to do. And when you're witnessing against someone in, your, in a court of law, I believe you can use deception in court so long as you're not lying, you can use deception to try to convince people that someone is guilty of something if you know, in fact, that they're guilty. Um, and you can conceal certain things that, that um, if the person's wrong, uh, if, they've, if, they've, excuse me, if they've done, if they've technically done something wrong, um you can uh you can defend that person through the technicalities as long as you're not lying it's it can sometimes be valid to defend the person even though it gives a, a false impression to other people um and we just see so many examples in scripture of false witness, uh, not false witness, but deception being used to protect people. Like, you know, the, the midwives. Imagine the midwives were probably brought to court, brought before the Pharaoh and questioned saying, what did you do? Technically they violated the law. They technically violated the law. But they didn't lie and they didn't give false witness by in the lying sense. They gave false witness in the deceiving sense, which, which is valid uh, when it's done for a righteous purpose. So the, the midwives, the Egyptian midwives, they basically said uh, they gave an excuse, which was technically true, but it was a deceptive excuse to protect the babies from being killed. Because the Egyptians wanted to kill the firstborn sons. These Egyptian midwives deceived the Egyptians in order to save the life of the babies, the male sons. And that's an example of a righteous false witness, bearing false witness righteously. Because there's no lie being done, and it's a righteous deception against an unjust law, a corrupt law, that should never have been in place. So we are to use deception and false witness in that sense when there's an unjust law to protect the innocent, to, to protect those who don't deserve to be punished for a crime. And then we go to do not steal. Well, hold, you know, it, do not steal, but in the Bible we see examples of people taking things from other people without those people's permission. So suddenly, according to the Bible, it's okay to steal. It also says in the book of Deuteronomy, you know, around chapter 21, somewhere around, it says that you can walk into anyone's property and pick fruit from their trees without their permission. It says as long as you don't harvest it by putting it into a bucket or a bag to carry it all with you back to another place, as long as you're only picking one or picking only what you can handle in your hands and not using tools and buckets to carry it away. You can pick food for yourself without the person's permission. That's technically considered stealing in our definition. But the Bible endorses it. And you have to remember, the things of this earth are not ours. They're being loaned to us. So God's telling us, you can use these things. However, there's exceptions where if people are really in need, they can take things without other people's permission, as long as they're not taking more than they need at a time. Uh, so, um, 
I believe that there's examples, you know, let, let's say, let's say there's a city or a government that takes all the food in your area and hides it so that you can't buy any food and there's no food available. The only food available is in the possession of the government leaders. Well, then it is your duty, responsibility, to steal that food for yourself. Um, so really, when when command when the command is you shall not steal, the intention is not never steal, but do not steal from someone who doesn't deserve to be stolen from. Do not steal from someone who what they have validly belongs to them. So, for example, if someone steals your stuff, if you have, let's say you have a car, and someone steals your car, and you find out who it is, it's not stealing in a bad sense to take that car that you own, belongs to you, take it back without the guy's permission. Even though the guy currently possesses that car because he stole it from you, you are allowed to steal it back because it is yours already. So the fact that he doesn't own it, it's not his, justifies stealing it from him. So when someone does not deserve to own that possession anymore or never, then you have the right to steal from them, uh, to take it from them without their permission. That's why you've got also um, copyright, for example, or the concept of copyright. No one has a justification for copyright. So you are allowed to steal people's copyright because morally it's not binding. According to the government, it's binding, but according to common sense, the concept of copyright is nonsense. So we have the right to take things with, to take copyrighted works without the creator's permission, uh, without the person who made that book or video or whatever that's being copyrighted, we can take it without their permission because it was never theirs to begin with uh, to withhold from us. It doesn't belong to them to keep like that. So there are examples where we can steal because it doesn't belong to them to keep for themselves. And, um, and, and if it's ours, we can take it back. And there's just many examples of where stealing is not always wrong. So anyways, that's how you take it for the stealing. And finally, you've got, again, it's similar to do not steal, it's coveting. Do not covet your neighbor's possessions. And the possessions it lists are, it says, whatever belongs to your neighbor, including his cattle, donkey, ox, maid servant, or a male servant, his field, house, or even his wife. Do not covet it. Covet means like to desire, to want what that person has for yourself. You want to have it and you want the person who has it to not have it. Normally it's considered wrong and immoral to covet the person's stuff because it's theirs, it's their right, it belongs to them. But again, what if that person stole your car? Well, you have a right to covet your own car that the person stole. So the car is in his possession illegally. You have a right to covet your own possession that someone else is currently possessing. That currently, it belongs to that person, but it's not actually theirs, their right to keep it. So you have a right to covet things that don't belong to them justly. If someone takes something for themselves, you have a right to covet it when they don't deserve to keep the thing that they took and are possessing. And that leads to the adultery aspect of you should not commit adultery. Now how do we define do not commit adultery? Many people define adultery as a man or woman having sex with someone. A, man, a married man or a married woman having sex with someone that they are not married to um, and in the context of uh, monogamy. So if a married man has sex with a woman that's not, that he, that is not his one and only wife, then he's considered an adulterer. If a woman who's married has sex with another man 
who's not his one and only husband, she's considered an, an adulteress. However, there's a concept in scripture of concubine. We see that women are, it, it is justified in the scriptures, it is endorsed, and it's considered righteous in the Bible, the practice of concubine. And what the practice of concubine is, is not another wife, is not another sex partner, it's a replacement, temporary replacement. It's essentially spouse swap. It's essentially, you know, if you've ever seen the show or you've heard of the show Wife Swap, the idea is they swap wives with another person. It's not, so it's, sw it's swapping wives. It's not taking two wives for yourself. So, you would, so it's the whole idea of substitute or replacement. Just like if you have a teacher, if you have a teacher who's then replaced by a substitute teacher. You don't have two people teaching right now. The, the primary teacher is going home, resting from his responsibilities and duties. Someone else came to be the teacher in that teacher's place. It's a substitute teacher and is the only teacher until the, te the, the main teacher is able to resume his duties. Once the main teacher is able to resume the duties, the substitute teacher stops teaching those cl that class. So you see how that works? It's the same thing with substitute spouses. When a wife is unable to perform the duties of childbearing that the husband wants, the husband and wife can mutually agree to have another woman temporarily take his wife's place. So that wife actually stops having her role as a wife and another woman is put in her place. So he doesn't sleep with two women at the same time. He sleeps with one woman as and the, the concubine is considered his new wife in place of his old wife until the old wife is ready to take back her place as the only wife. So you don't have two wives, you switch which person you consider your wife. So when Abraham had Sarah as his wife and then he took Hagar as his concubine, Sarah stopped being his wife in function. She step down from her duties to take a break from it and put someone else in her place to serve as Abraham's wife. So she took Hagar and Hagar became Abraham's only wife for that time. Sarah was not treated legally as Abraham's wife during that time. It was swapped and that's what the whole con concubine concept is. To help the woman uh, have children because she's not able to have children or she doesn't want to have children. So imagine you've had tons of children and you're getting tired. You don't want to go through another pregnancy right now. You're like, oh, I don't want to go through another pregnancy. But your husband does. And you both want children, but you don't want to go through it right now. But you know it really means to him a lot that he wants to have another child soon. So you say, okay, well, I don't want to have a child right now. But if you want a child so much, I'll. I'll agree to have another woman take my place and she will be your wife instead of me until she becomes pregnant and gives birth to a child and then she'll stop being your wife and I'll become your wife again. So it's monogamy here. It's not polygamy, this concept of concubine. Um, I believe polygamy is a sin and is unrighteous and condemned in the scriptures as adultery that deserves death penalty. But for concubines, if it's done properly, with consent of both spouses, I don't think it's wrong. Um, and while what I just said is not as controversial, the next thing I'll say I think is a little more controversial, and that is I think I think the man is also able to do the same thing. So a wo a woman, like let's say the husband is the one who cannot have children, or the husband for some strange reason he doesn't want to have children. Maybe he has a sexual disorder, an STD that he doesn't want to pass, he does not want to pass on to a child. Or maybe he's he has too much drugs or alcohol in his system. So in, instead instead of waiting to for his wife to have a child, they can both mutually agree to find another man to temporarily take his place. So he stops being considered her husband. And some other man becomes her husband in his place 
until she conceives and gives birth to a child, and then it reverts back. The the normal the or the main husband he can take his back his place, and then he becomes the new husband, or he becomes the the husband when the male concubine stops being the husband of of his wife. So again, same thing. It's it's the if a husband does not does not want to impregnate his wife, he can stop being her husband and pick someone else to be her temporary husband in his place as his substitute. During that time, he will not be considered the original husband will not be considered the husband anymore of the wife, but the substitute will be considered her husband until she gives birth or if it's a miscarriage and they stop their relationship if they stop that sexual relationship it reverts back to the to the actual husband uh, and the substitute husband ceases to be husband so that's how I think it, it would work and I think that's acceptable and righteous and so Coveting, I think it's not wrong to covet a married woman if that married woman has no right to be married to the man she's married with. If their marriage is unlawful and if they're morally obligated to divorce each other because their marriage is forbidden, then it's not wrong to covet, covet the neighbor's wife necessarily. Uh, for example, if you got, if you have two women uh, if, if, if you're if uh, if you are attracted to a woman and then she decides to pursue a sinful lifestyle and she decides to become a lesbian and marries another woman I don't think it's wrong to covet that woman even though she is in a lesbian marriage and she's your neighbor's wife because women women are your neighbors too so if you're female neighbor uh, has a wife I don't think it'd be wrong necessarily to covet that woman because that marriage is abomination and should be ended uh, you can have a desire to marry that person with the hope that they their life will be changed you can help them become righteous and forsake the lesbian sins of their life uh, so that's an example of where I think it'd be valid to covet your neighbor's wife because the marriage is not binding it's not valid they just they are obligated to divorce each other in a similar way you know uh, we're, we're told in the, in the gospel account that if you divorce and remarry that's considered adultery so if a if oh, well, let's see if a If a man divorces his wife and his wife then marries another man, or vice versa, uh, the, the woman divorces the husband and the husband marries another woman, that's an adulterous marriage. Because it's adulterous, they, they don't deserve to be in that relationship. That relationship is unlawful. It needs to be ended. So I don't see it's wrong to covet someone in that type of relationship because that's not a binding relationship in God's eyes as long as that relationship ends and it's supposed to end they're now free to remarry because how I think remarriage works this places in scripture where it seems to say that divorce and remarriage is never allowed and then other places where it seems that it is allowed and I think there's a middle ground there how I think it works is if a married couple are lawfully married and then they divorce even if they're justified to divorce if there was adultery or anything regardless of what happened if there's a divorce neither of them are allowed to get married why remarried to someone else because they are morally obligated to reconcile or to stay single for the sake of reconciliation even if it's even if it seems hopeless even if it seems highly unlikely and almost like it's never going to happen that they're going to reconcile. They're, supposed, they're obligated. According to the Shepherd of Hermas, according to the Messiah statement, 
in the Gospels, they're obligated to remain single. Um, however, if one of the two marries someone else, according to Deuteronomy, they're not allowed to return to their former spouse. If you divorce someone and marry someone else, you can't go back to another spouse before that because we're told that it's considered an abomination to return to a former spouse. So according to the Shepherd of Hermas, the command to remain single after you divorce is for the sake of reconciliation. That's the sole reason Shepherd of Hermas tells us of why we're not to remarry and why it's adultery to remarry. If then you do remarry, that's adultery. But now that you've remarried, you can't reconcile. So the whole reason of not remarrying in the first place was for the sake of reconciliation. If you marry someone and thereby committing adultery, you can't reconcile anymore. And that ceases, that makes the reason to not remarry cease. So now you can remarry. However, because the, per the person who violated this, who destroyed their marriage by remarrying and committing adultery by doing so, they had to repent. But how can you repent if you remain in an adulterous marriage? So if you divorce and then one of the two remarries, that's an adulterous marriage. Even if you repent and say, I'm sorry, you are still in an adulterous marriage. And so that means the right thing to do if you're in an adulterous marriage is to divorce that person. Once you're divorced, since you cannot return to your former spouse, the whole reason to stay single and not remarry again, according to Shepard Hermas, that's the whole reason. Well, that whole reason is now no longer binding, which means you both would be free to remarry. So that's how I view it, so that if someone has divorced someone else, and then they... Uh, remarry unlawfully, they're in an adulterous marriage. So we, it, it's not wrong to covet someone who's in an adulterous marriage because they don't have a right to be in that marriage in the first place. So that marriage should be ended as soon as possible. And once that marriage is ended, they are then are allowed to marry someone else. So I think it's not wrong to covet uh, a woman who's uh, married to your neighbor in an adulterous marriage. Uh, and uh, same thing with, as I said, you know, if, if, you, if the person has your car, if they stole your car, it's not wrong to covet your car. If that's your car, they don't deserve that car. It's not theirs. It's not uh, their right to keep, to have that car. Um, and it's not wrong to want something that your neighbor has as long you know if you're going about it in a just way if your neighbor has a car and you really want that car for yourself and you want your neighbor to not have that car it's not wrong all you have to do is say okay I'd like to buy that car from you that's a righteous coveting you're coveting someone else's possession in a just way because you want it for yourself but in a way that you're being righteous when someone scripture says do not covet it's speaking specifically of do not desire what belongs to someone else and you have no right to desire that or you desire it in an unrighteous way. That's what it's talking about. For adultery, a marriage that's valid, you are not to violate that by, by uh, having a second... Uh, you are not to have sex with someone who is not your your spouse and you're not allowed to have more than one wife or more than one husband so the fact that you're not allowed to marry more than one person and you're not allowed to have sex with anyone who's not who you're not married to that's what's being forbidden here but the practice of concubine is not being forbidden because a concubine effectively stays within the measures of only have sex with someone you're married to and you can only have one person you're married to because what happens is you do a spouse swap. Your wife is replaced and is no longer your wife for the time being, and another woman takes her place as the wife or for the husband. The, the husband 
stops being the husband temporarily, and another husband takes his place temporarily as the woman's husband. One person that they're married to, and they can't have sex with anyone that they're not married to, otherwise it's adultery and forbid it. But you could you could call the whole practice of concubine adultery if you use a certain definition, uh, the modern definition. So, anyways, that's my main take on these Ten Commandments and how I see exceptions in them, and how I see that scripture can be very tricky, and you you got to be careful with applying words across the board in all the possible contexts because it was never passages of scripture or language in general is never intended to apply across the board in every nuance of that meaning of that word it's just not how it was that's not how language works so because there's so many different distinctions of of nuance of meaning for these different terms and ideas we can't just say oh it says you can't you can't steal so that's wrong to, to ever take something without someone's permission or you shall not kill so you can't kill animals you can't kill plants you can't defend yourself when someone's trying to kill you because it'd be wrong to kill someone or you can't go to war because that would be killing someone you see how it starts getting absurd when you're applying it way too literally or not not literally but you're applying it too broadly too much difference of meaning when it was only intended for a very narrow context but instead you apply it on every context of that word which is not valid you shall honor your father and mother well oh you know i mean if your parents tell you to kill someone you should do it because they're your parents and you need to honor them right no 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 so as you see there's nuances here and we got to be very careful because this type of nuance happens all throughout scripture it's so easy to fall prey to this and be deceived into applying a certain passage across the board in every context they do that people do that with with sin the passages that speak about everyone being sinful or no one being without sin they take it apply it across the board to every possible meaning of that word and suddenly it's perverted from the intended context the word for sin does not always refer to immoral sometimes it refers to innocent mistakes that are not that are not evil and do not deserve eternal punishment it uses it in the bible it uses the word sin in the hebrew to it uses it in a place to refer to missing the mark when you miss uh, it talks about uh, having bad aim when the uh, in the book of Judges it says they were so had such good aim they could sling a stone at a hair and not sin but most translations translate it miss because they know it's not talking about sin and yet this if you were to take that word and try to apply it across the board you would say oh, okay well uh, that word means sin, so if you have bad aim and you can't hit a hair with a stone, that means you're sinning. That's what probably some people believe because of how ignorant they are of nuance of language. Similarly, you see that word miss and you think, oh, okay, well, that means it's sin is not ever sin. And that's also a silly thing. So, you know, adultery, you could say, oh, that's not sin, that, that's just a miss. That's just a miss, you're just a mistake, it's not a sin. Well, no, now you're taking it, you're taking it so that, yes, it can mean just an innocent mistake, but sometimes it can mean an evil thing that you did. But to take it one meaning and apply it across the board as the only meaning, that's not how it works validly when you're trying to speak a language or, or read or communicate in a language. So there's just so many examples where this, the nuances of context so easily lead to deception, major false teaching, heresy, damnation, uh, false doctrine, and major sins, all because of ignorance of language. So you, we have to be really careful when we're studying the scriptures and how we apply them. We should test the scriptures according to logic. A lot of people don't think that's true, but we, it is. 
the logic is is superior to the scriptures and we need to filter the scriptures through logic so we properly understand what it's saying and we don't abuse it in context it's not intended to be used for so and we're, we're we are to test the spirits we are to test every thing that's in scripture and not blindly accept anything the bible says because man has man's hand has touched it and has corrupted the scriptures and man's interpretation has corrupted it the original language of scripture is long gone we are, we have a very inferior understanding of the language of the Bible, especially Hebrew. Uh, you can look in NIV in their footnotes, and almost like in so many times in the footnotes, they'll say the meaning of the Hebrew for this passage is very uncertain. We had to use another, we had to use the Greek version, the Septuagint, instead because we had no clue really what the Hebrew was talking about. How to, we didn't know how to translate it because it was too difficult for us. And that's because Hebrew almost became a dead language, essentially, and we've lost a lot of understanding of how Hebrew worked in, in ancient times. We've lost a lot of vocabulary. We don't have a full grasp on some of the grammar and the origin of some of the Hebrew stuff. So things have changed, and language has changed. So we gotta be, we got to understand that the language of Scripture is easily corruptible and easily deceptive. We can easily be deceived by the language used in scripture, so we have to be very studious and seek the truth with an open mind, open heart, and seek it with all our heart in a pure and unbiased way as much as possible. Anyways, that's my teaching, on my, my unique uh, controversial teaching on the Ten Commandments, so I hope you enjoyed it, and hopefully I'll be able to have, hopefully I'll be able to have, uh, more teachings soon. As, as long as I'm not in jail, uh, I'll be able to do more teachings for you guys. Yeah. So shalom, everybody, and have a wonderful, have a wonderful week or a wonderful year. Why not? Have a wonderful year. Shalom and God bless you all.